Coming up, two legendary artists tell the story of an all-star collaboration. One of the artists was fronting one of the biggest bands in rock. The other had just left a classic duo to create a solo career. And actually, they had just collaborated on a Grammy-winning song about a year before this. And they were afraid that they jinxed their partnership with their next song, you know, sophomore jinx. So after a while apart, they ran into each other in the supermarket. And they said, let's just get together and write a piece of crap. Get that out of the way, and then we can write a good one. That piece of crap became another Grammy winner and a 70s classic. When they wrote the chorus, they thought it was a love song, but it changed with one event. Find out the story in our exclusive interview with both of them next. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you've ever called a radio station hundreds of times, keep dialing, keep dialing, to request your favorite song, or even to win tickets for a concert, you're gonna dig this channel. Music nostalgia of the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, through interview and story. Make sure to subscribe right now. Click the bell to be the first to know when our newest episodes and, and interviews come out. Also, check us out on Patreon for behind the scenes content and exclusive interviews. So I'm excited to bring you yet another episode from our series, Revelations, one of my favorite programs we do on here. This is where featured artists reveal rare stories about their biggest songs. Man, on this installment of Revelations, we have a real banger. Uh, we have two legends on one of the best all-star collaborations of the 70s. We've talked about this song before uh, way back in the day. I'm really pumped about this. It's actually the story of the smooth Yacht Rock classic, This Is It, with the co-captains of this genre, Michael McDonald, McD, and Kenny Loggins. doesn't get better than this. Two of the most distinct voices ever. Mick D, he was fronting the Doobie Brothers at this time. After some time with Steely Dan, he was actually referred to the Doobies by Skunk Baxter, uh, when Tom Johnston got sick and had to step away for a bit. And then Kenny Loggins had gone solo after dominating the 70s as part of the duo Loggins and Messina. Your mama don't dance and your daddy don't rock and roll. Kenny and Michael came together and wrote the Grammy-winning number one hit, What a Fool Believes. What a fool believes. Both released their own versions. Uh, the Doobies version was the hit. What a fool they won the Grammy for Song of the Year and Record of the Year. Number one hit, one of the only ones in, in the disco uh, for the year in disco. Pretty much everything else was disco that year. Go. And after this success, they were a little bit gun-shy to get back together, afraid of the sophomore jinx, so they didn't pursue it right off the bat. Then they ran into each other at the supermarket. I'm going to let them tell you that story. It's funny. This song started out with a dynamite chorus that uh, both of them thought might be a love song until a life-changing event happened in one of their lives and pretty much the universe expressed to them what the song should be about. Great story coming up. So jump on the yacht. We're going to cruise down uh, with this song. As we get into this, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny I wear the glasses that I always wear on here. So check it out. If you go to the special link up here, right-hand corner, where the little info button is, uh, you can get a brand new pair of complete prescription glasses or sunglasses for up to 80% off normal retail prices. I mean, you get to choose your style, your color, your shape. They deliver them right to your door. Uh, again, click on this info button up here to get the best deals. Tell them Professor Rock sent you. This is it. Make no mistake. Well, let's talk about Keep the Fire, produced by Tom Dowd. Legendary yeah, Tom Tommy Dowd. Dowd who another did, one uh, of the strange ones. <laughs> well, I know that he was there. Interesting guy. Ray Charles, he was the one that had the idea to turn What Did I Say into two parts. And I didn't know that. Also was there and Mac the Knife when Bobby Darren recorded that. Great history there. You know, he was a nuclear physicist. He was not originally a record producer. <laughs> he turned his back on that part of the world when I guess the the atomic shit hit the when fan were, yeah. and decided that he was gonna make music instead. And he did a great job. Oh, yeah. For me, 
Layla was the defining oh, moment yeah. for Tommy Dowd. The fact that he had all those guitar players in that room, and instead of making them decide which one would be the one in front, he let them all blow at the same time. No one had done that before. This is it. NCAA tournament used it two years in a row back in the 80s. Nas, of course, sampled it. You probably got some uh, street cred with your kids all the time. No matter Tell me the story about This Is It because it's a really cool story. Because it started yeah, out kind well, of as a love song. I'll give but, you, I'll give yeah. you the, the whole version. The first song Michael and I wrote together was What a Fool Believes. What a fool believes. And that won an, a Grammy and scared the shit out of us because it's like, <laughs> where do you go from there? Right. And we, for the longest time, we didn't call each other back to to make another writing date. And I ran into him one day and I said, Michael, we got to get together, we got to write again. Let's just get together, write a shitty song and get that out of the way. <laughs> you know, Cause that's what we're scared of, right? So just do that and then put that over there. And the session uh, for This Is It, well, first of all, writing This Is It was our second uh, uh, sophomore attempt to write a song together. And, um, we probably even started some other things in between, but you know, they were, we always had something, in, you know, in the can going uh, during that period of time. But this is it was the, the next real contender for us finishing, actually finishing the song. No you and it was uh, originally an idea I think Kenny had. Uh, he wanted to write a song to his father who was going through some health problems and, uh, at the time. And so this was a very personal song, kind of a, uh, an idea that Kenny kind of came to me with. And uh, um, I just did my best to kind of come up with the chord progressions in the, in the music. And, uh, you know, I think he, he might have already had the, the, the feel in mind and stuff and, and uh, probably saw a lot of the melody in his head. So, uh, you know, we Again, we together we we work to kind of flush out the song, the bridge, the the, uh, uh, the chorus, and, and things. But I, that song for uh, for my money was always a very personal song to Kenny, and uh, and and originally started with an idea of his, and we got really lucky on our uh, second attempt. You know, we we. we we hit the charts again, and uh, so we were thrilled, and we were kind of off and running. Again. And the the session was a lot of fun. Um, we were probably uh, back in the days of uh, you know showing up to work and you know being musicians. We uh, we weren't in great shape at the end of the session, but uh, we managed to get the track and. Uh, it was with Kenny's band, who were all great players, and uh, they did a, a stellar job. And um, by the time we left, Tom Dowd was the producer, and uh, I don't know that Tom had that much faith in the song. When I played it down for him at the piano, uh, he seemed to mention something like, "Ah, eh, that that doesn't work." <laughs> and, uh, I think he wanted me to change some of the bar structure of the song, and I said, "No." I, that's just how it goes, you know. I was, you know, I just felt like once you've written a song, if, it, if that's what you've written, that's what it is, you know. Um, I, I wasn't really, uh, you know, all that excited about trying to rewrite the song on the spot, although I've done that, you know. Uh, but uh, that particular day, I, I just felt like what we had was really what the song wanted to be. And uh, so we went ahead and Cut, cut the track as was, band learned it, and uh, the rest is history, you know. No time for wondering why. So the second song we wrote, the shitty song we wrote was This Is It, <laughs> which, which ended up winning a, a Grammy too. Yeah, they won a Grammy yeah. for best pop and, uh, yeah. and But when we wrote it, we, we had two lines of lyric that came with the me initial melody. There have been times in my life I've been wondering why. In my life. Which is a, a great opening line for anything. It could be yeah. a great opening line for a book. And uh, yeah, I think I'll do that. 
And uh, you think that maybe it's over only if you want it to be. And we thought that maybe it's over was referring to a relationship. So a couple times we wrote versions of the song. I wish I had them now. It'd be kind of hilarious. That had boy girl lyrics in them. And each time we, we threw them away because it, it didn't capture the spirit of the song. And then while we were working on that song, my dad went in the hospital for major surgery. And uh, I visited him in the hospital the morning of the surgery. We had a discussion about whether or not he was going to survive. And he was trying to convince me that he was prepared to die on the operating table. And I figured since it was hemorrhoid surgery, I had a fighting chance he might make it. <laughs> we talked about that. Not really. No, I'm kidding. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, so while I was waiting for the surgery to be over, I went back to write with Michael. And then when we got to the line, you think that maybe it's over only if you want it to be. Uh, then we immediately, I knew what the song was about and I just described to him what I'd been doing all morning and he went, absolutely, let's write that. But I like to joke that uh, we knew that the song was about the NBA playoffs and. <laughs> you know? So we wrote it as a life and death moment yeah. for that. Do or die, yeah. March Madness. It's here, the moment is now about to as I understand it, you've forgotten the lyrics to the song a few times when singing it live. I'm kind of well known for forgetting lyrics, you know. Um, I forget lyrics to my own songs on my way out to the stage, you know. I. I more than once panicked walking out on stage before a performance with the band and all of a sudden grabbing somebody's arm and going, what's the first verse to the first song we're doing, you know? And it just, you know, um, I, uh, I'm sure that'll materialize into something as I get older, some kind of dementia or something, but I, uh, I've done that more than once, you know, where you just come up on a verse and you're just going, what the hell? Um, and more times than not, I, I'll just fake it, you know, make up words right on the spot uh, or sounds or whatever. But uh, typically, you know, what I rely on is that in that last moment, if you just don't freeze up, you know, seize up and uh, just let the song come out, you, the, the lyric will come, you know, but uh, it's 50-50. <laughs> and uh, so one night we were doing uh, This Is It. I'm just one of those people that if I cram for a test the night before, the chances of me passing that test the next day are not good, you know. Um, and uh, that was one of those situations where I hadn't sung the song. My, I don't know if I'd sung the song ever, but we were doing it on a special. And um, so I, I really crammed on the lyrics and I think I went in there half thinking in a defeatist frame of mind that, you know, I'm, I know I'm going to forget this, you know, and sure enough, you know, got to my second verse and it just didn't come to me. And, um, uh, so I had to kind of make light of it and, and right back there in front of the audience. And, uh, I think Kenny wanted to strangle me, but he was, you know, good natured about it. <laughs> um, but like I say, that's not the first time it's happened to me, and I'm sure it won't be the last. You know, you know I think uh, I've known Kenny for so many years now. I, you know, one of the really, you know, to me, uh, one of the best aspects of the music business as it has played out for me over the years is uh, still knowing and still performing at times with people that I performed with 40, 50 years ago. Uh, met 40 years ago. And I don't think any of us ever thought, you know, uh, we'd still be doing this at our age, you know. Uh, that just didn't seem to be the way it worked back when we grew up, you know. Uh, people didn't go out and rock and roll in their 70s and 80s, you know, but that's changed, you know. Somebody had to break that ice, but it's changed. And, um, uh, you know, I, and I'm grateful for that, uh, you know, more than anything else, uh, I think, as I, or it was uh, high on my list is the fact that I'm so grateful for uh, the fact that after all these years, I'm, I, I get on stage with Donald Fagan and, and, and just up to before Walter passed away, uh, we played the New Orleans Jazz Festival together and 
I came out and sat in with them on their set and it hit me then, you know, how, uh, you know, did I ever think for a minute that, uh, you know, well into our 60s, uh, I'd still be walking out on stage with these guys. Uh, same with Kenny and I, you know, we've done gigs together recently in recent years and uh, these songs are still with us and uh, people still remember these songs. It's, uh, that's one of the most uh, wonderful uh, experiences of this whole ride that I've had is uh, working with people who are the caliber of Kenny Loggins. And Burt Bacharach, uh, Donald and Walter, you know, uh, I have to pinch myself uh, whenever I think about those things that, that I ever got that opportunity is, uh, it's kind of unbelievable, really. Um, and I think what people would want and would, would maybe not know about Kenny is just as a person, uh, you know, you don't stay friends with somebody for 50 years unless uh, as a person, there's something there that, that you admire, you know, and uh, I, I truly admire Kenny. I, I always admired his work ethic. I always admired his talent, but I admire him too. Uh, I, we've lived in the same community uh, for many years now, for about 50, 40 years and uh, off and on, you know, and uh, this community has totally benefited by Kenny's uh, participation as a citizen here in Santa Barbara, California. Uh, countless families who, uh, underprivileged families, have uh, gotten the things they need, you know, the, the food, the groceries, the, the utensils, the, the, the furniture, whatever uh, uh, that they need to, to survive and raise their families, you know, in, in hard times, you know, uh, when they needed help the most. Uh, and we've all been there, you know. Um, and uh, thanks to Kenny and uh, Unity Shop, uh, which is a, a, an organization that he has worked tirelessly for you know, year in, year out. There's even a community center there named after Kennedy uh, for all his participation and uh, what he brings to the community in terms of reminding all the rest of us to try to help those less fortunate, I think is uh, one of the most admirable things about him. And um, I'm proud to call him my friend uh, for that reason as much as any, you know. Do you mind uh, playing a little of it? Well, sure. Um, not to put you on the spot, but... This is the Redwoods version. Yeah. There have been times in my life I've been wondering why Still, somehow I believe Now, now I'm not so sure you wait and he one good reason to try. Lord, what more can I say? Mm. You'd think that maybe it's over. Not if you don't want it to be. For it's miracle stand up and find this is it make no mistake where you are you're going love further the waiting is over etc et 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 yeah sounds wonderful Thank you. When you did it with Daryl, live at Daryl's house, it was sure great to see you guys together, man. It was it was a really fun day. You know, Rob Lowe on his podcast with Kenny Loggins uh, about a year ago, he said that he felt like Michael Jackson lifted uh, some of his vocal nuances after that from This Is It. And if you go listen to it, the chicka chicka and all that kind of stuff, I think Rob Lowe has a point there. I, I thought the same thing when he said that. I was like, that's really cool. Check 
check out the podcast with Kenny Loggins. Uh, Rob Lowe does such a great job with that. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Michael McDonald, Kenny Loggins below, one of the great duos together on this song. What do you think about the harmonies? What are your memories of the song? What are your feelings on Yacht Rock? What other uh, songs should we cover, interview should we do from this great genre that's been named years after, <laughs> after the music was, was popular, the smooth music? Let us know. If you like our content, subscribe below. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Till next time, three chords and a treat, my friend.